Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our look at reinforced concrete beam design, and in particular, we will be exploring how to apply uh, and how to calculate uh, the moment capacity of beams that have compression reinforcement built into them. We will be looking at how to calculate the moment of uh, the moment capacity of beams with compression reinforcement, and we will also be looking at uh, some of the benefits of using compression reinforcement in terms of general design procedures and benefits. So we're going to work with one beam today, one example beam, and it will be as follows. So a relatively straightforward beam. We will have a beam, and this beam is going to be rectangular. It will be 12 inches wide and also 24 inches high. Now, if you're not familiar, when I say compression reinforcement, what I mean by that is uh, previously everything we've looked at has had just steel positioned at the bottom, and if this is in positive bending, that will be in tension. And so it will only carry uh, all the, the only steels at the bottom carrying tensile forces if this is in positive bending. Now, if this is in, still in positive bending, what happens if I put steel up here? What happens if I put steel at the top of the beam? Well, as we know, the top of, in positive bending, the top of the beam is going to go into compression and the bottom of the beam is going to go into tension. So this steel up here is actually not carrying a tensile force, which is what we expect with most reinforced concrete beam design. Instead, this top steel is carrying compression. So we refer to this as compression steel. So uh, let's go ahead and put some distances on here. This is gonna be a three inches. And this is also gonna be a value of three inches. So we have a rectangular concrete beam. It has a depth, a total height, I shouldn't say depth, a total height of 24 inches, a width of 12 inches. And then we have a compression steel at the top and tension steel at the bottom, each positioned three inches from the center line of the steel to the outer surface of the uh, beam face. Let's see, <clears throat> some other things. We have three number eight bars for both the compression and tension steel. Now that actually isn't typical. Usually you would use far less compression steel than tension steel, but I wanted to use the same amount for both just to illustrate how these interact with each other. So, I'm act so by adding this compression steel, I'm actually doubling the total amount of steel present in this beam. Uh, let's see, in terms of material properties, we're going to use a yield stress for our steel of 60 KSI, as we've been using pretty commonly this term. And let's say we have concrete with a specified 28-day compressive strength, or F10C, uh, equal to uh, 4,000 PSI. So 4,000 PSI. So all of this is given. And I want to find the design moment capacity, or VMN, with and without uh, the compression steel present. Uh, with and without compression steel present. And through this example, we will explore how compression steel works, what are some of the benefits of it, um, and how to, ca how to actually calculate the moment capacity for both of them. So I'm going to first calculate its moment capacity, uh, ignoring the compression steel. And this is actually always allowed. This is something you, even if you have a beam with compression reinforcement, you don't actually have to count on it if you don't want to. You're allowed to ignore it uh, if you just want to be a little bit extra conservative. But uh, let's first look at the beam with, uh, without the compression steel present. So we have just our tension steel. And again, we have the distance here of three inches, the clear distance of, well, not clear distance, the center line to the outer surface distance of three inches. Uh, we have a height of 24 inches. That's not going to change. And now in terms of our area of steel, this is going to be a fairly straightforward calculation. Uh, area of steel. So there's no prime on this yet. This is just area of steel. Uh, that We have three bars there, number eight bars. So we have three times, uh, now a number eight bar has, an, has a diameter of one inch, or uh, eight, basically eight eighths of an inch. If you're ever curious where the uh, numbering of steel bars comes from, a number eight bar, for example, a number eight bar has a diameter of eight eighths. 
is one way of thinking of that, or a diameter of one inch. So number seven bar has a diameter of seven eighths of an inch. And that's not always perfectly followed, but that's the general idea for traditional naming of uh, English uh, rebar sizes. Okay, so we have our area of steel, and then so we have three bars, and we want to get uh, the area of each of them. And I'm just going to use pi diameter squared over 4 instead of pi r squared. We have a diameter of 4 inches, quantity squared, divided by 4. And that comes to an area of steel of tension reinforcement of 2.36 uh, square inches. Now, assuming the steel has yielded, I'm going to go, and I, and I am going to go through this fairly quickly. This is stuff we've covered plenty of times before. And so our uh, tension force, our total tension force, is ASFY. If we assume that the steel has yielded, then the total tension force is simply equal to the area of the steel times the yield capacity. And uh, if you multiply 60 KSI times this area, I got a, an amount of 141.4 kips. And then in turn, I want to figure out the Whitney stress block area that I need to, produ to produce equilibrium. As you recall, we're going to have part of the... Uh, the the steel is going to, the, the tension steel is of course going to carry the tension force and the concrete at some depth of the Whitney stress block will carry our compression force. Uh, if we don't have any kind of compression steel, all of, the all of the compression force is carried by the concrete. So we have a certain depth of this Whitney stress block A and that is stressed at a level equal to 0 0.85 F prime C, as you may recall. So uh, I want to go ahead and calculate the Whitney stress block uh, depth. And, and to do that, I'm first going to calculate the, uh, uh, the Whitney stress block stress. So in other words, what exactly in our case is 0.85 F prime C? So I could call this the Whitney stress block stress, or I could simply call this the Whitney stress, depending on how you want to phrase it. And 0 0.85 F prime C, if you multiply 0 0.85 times 4,000 PSI, I get a stress value of 3,400 PSI. So again, with the Whitney stress block, we are modeling our concrete as having a uniform stress throughout its depth. And that isn't exactly perfect. It's actually a fairly complex relationship. But through the years, engineers have determined that we can approximate the stress to a reasonable degree of act and accuracy with this Whitney stress block method. Okay, so we have our stress that this area has. Now, if we want to balance the uh, total tension force, we need to achieve equilibrium. So in other words, our tension force, if we're going to achieve equilibrium, the tension force, the tension force in the steel, must be equal to the total concrete compressive force. And we, de we designate that C sub C for the concrete compressive force. Um, or another way we can say that is the Whitney stress block stress times the area of it. So if you want to find the area required of the Whitney stress block, you can simply divide the total uh, tension force by the Whitney stress block stress level. And let's see, that will be 141.4 kips divided by uh, 3.4 KSI or 3,500 or 3,400 PSI. So I just have this in 3.4 KSI, just dividing by a thousand to go from PSI to, to KSI, and I get an area of 41.6 square inches. So our Whitney stress block must have an area of 41.6 uh, square inches, and then our Whitney stress block depth is going to be 41.6. If I want to, so I know that my Whitney stress block will have an area of 41.6 square inches, and I, since I know this is a simple rectangular section, I can simply divide by the beam width to get our depth A here. So 41.6 inches squared divided by a beam width of 12 inches, and that produces a, an A, our Whitney stress block depth measure of 3.46 inches. So then I'm going to come over here, use a little more space, uh, my last little bit of space over here. My beta 1, as you may recall, beta 1 is the conversion factor or the ratio between the A and the C. Uh, it is A over C or where, where C is our neutral axis depth. So beta 1 
In this case, because our f prime c is less than or equal to 4,000 psi, we know that beta 1 is equal to 0 0.85. We're not going to have any reduction because of high strength approximate effects. And uh, from that, we can go and calculate, since now we know beta 1, we can go and calculate our neutral axis depth. Since a is equal to beta 1 times c, therefore c is equal to a over beta 1. And so c is going to equal our uh, 3.46 inches divided by our beta 1 of 0 0.85. And I get a neutral axis depth of 4.08 inches. And we will then use this to calculate our moment capacity as we've done in other uh, sessions. So again, this is going to be fairly, I'm going through this fairly quickly. I am assuming at this point that you are comfortable with calculating uh, uh, the moment capacity of beams with only tension reinforcement. So I'm going to wipe the board and then we will continue. So we have determined our C, our neutral axis depth, to be equal to 4.08 inches. And as a review from mechanics, the neutral axis depth is the depth uh, that our strain diagram crosses from the positive to negative or negative to positive. In other words, it is the depth of zero strain in the beam. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, ne I next need to determine the strain and the tension steel. Our epsilon t. And this will be essential for calculating our uh, feedback here later on. Uh, so determine strain uh, in tension steel. And I'm going to draw a simple uh, strain diagram. So at the top, we have our uh, concrete crushing stress, or sorry, concrete crushing strain of 0 0.003, which is epsilon C ultimate, or epsilon Cu. And then we have a linear strain diagram. And we have some epsilon t down at the bottom. And we have a neutral axis depth of 4.08 inches. And in turn, our total beam depth, uh, the total beam depth is, let's see, that is 24 inches. So the depth we're looking for is from the top surface of the beam to the center of the tension steel. And so that's going to be 24 inches minus 3 inches. And that comes to 21 inches. So that's our depth. And in turn, if I simply subtract 21 inches minus 4.08 inches, I will get 16.02 inches, or sorry, 16.92 inches for the distance from the bottom, uh, from the uh, center of the tension steel to the neutral axis. So I can then set up a pair of similar triangles. Going back to uh, grade school algebra, I can say epsilon t over 16.92 is equal to, I guess that wouldn't be grade school, that'd be more like middle school or maybe high school geometry, I, I don't know. When do you work at similar triangles? Probably geometry. So maybe grade school. Depends on your definition of grade school, I suppose. Uh, 0.003 divided by uh, 4.08 inches. So yes, again, this is just applications of similar triangles, setting this triangle is similar to this triangle. And if you do this, if you, solve, if you go and solve for epsilon t, I get an epsilon t value of, uh, point z of uh, let's see, 0 0.012. When I multiplied and divided, I got an epsilon t, the strain and the tension steel of 0 0.01t. So you can probably figure out this is, isn't actually the scale. If you were to draw this to scale, of course, you would have a, uh, you would have this upper triangle much, much, much shorter uh, and smaller than that, and that makes sense, but I usually draw them as relatively equal, simply for uh, illustration purposes. Okay, now we need to compare the, we'll need to compare this to our epsilon y, which is the yield strain of our steel. Epsilon y is the yield strain, and that is going to be simply 60 ksi, the yield stress of our steel, divided by our elastic modulus, which is 29,000 ksi. And that will come to 0 0.00207. Now, in terms of our phi factor that we're going to use, um, okay, so as you may recall from previous work, we can say that uh, if our epsilon t, if epsilon t is greater than or equal to our yield strain, so if the actual strain present in the steel 
is greater than or equal to the yield strain plus 0 0.003, we will have a fully tension controlled section and we can say that phi is equal to 0 0.9. And so let's take a look at this. So epsilon t is 0 0.012 inches, or sorry, not inches, just 0 0.012, it's a dimensionless quantity. And is this, what we need to ask, is this greater than or equal to epsilon yield plus 0 0.003? And that's just 0 0.00207 plus 0 0.003, and indeed, 0 0.012 is indeed greater than 0 0.00507. So therefore, we have a tension controlled section and phi is going to be equal to 0 0.9. So then all we have to do is calculate our nominal moment capacity and this isn't gonna to be too bad. And we could do this any number of ways. We could, uh, if we wanted to, we could sum moments about the top or sum moments at the bottom or sum moments about maybe the uh, centroid of the steel of the tension reinforcement, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use our standard formula where mn is equal to t times d minus a over t, where d minus a over 2 is going to be the length of our moment arm between the centroid of the, compress the concrete compression force, that's a, and the depth of the tension reinforcement. So when I go ahead and plug that in, so that's going to be our tension force of 141.4 kips. So we have 141.4 kips times our depth, our, our depth D of 21 inches minus A over 2. And again, A is 3.46 inches. And half of that to get to its centroid. And that will come to a value of, let's see, that is 27.24 kip inches. So 2,724 kip inches. And if you multiply that by 0 0.9, I got a design moment capacity of 24 or 2,452 uh, kip inches. So 2,452 kip inches. Again, I know that I went through that fairly quickly, but this is all standard stuff that we, the standard methods that we've looked at before when calculating the nominal moment capacity of singly reinforced uh, or uh, concrete beams with only tension reinforcement. So hopefully that's fairly straightforward. I knew I, I knew I went through that fairly quickly, but the main reason I wanted to calculate that was for later comparison between the cap, the, uh, the capacity of this beam, uh, both with the compression reinforcement and without the compression reinforcement. So, so far we've considered the case of the beam without the compression reinforcement considered, and now we're going to consider the case of the beam with the compression reinforcement uh, actually considered. So, we'll come back to, so uh, maybe if you're, if you're working through this as you go along, I would suggest keeping this value handy, and also the epsilon t value, that's going to be important, so make sure you have those handy, and then we'll be going through and working through uh, calculating the capacity of a beam with, uh, calculating the moment capacity of a beam with both compression and tension reinforcement uh, considered in the moment capacity. So I'll go ahead and wipe the board and we will get started on that. All right, so previously we calculated the, the moment capacity of this beam, but we ignored the compression reinforcement. Now what I wanna do is I want to recalculate its capacity, but this time actually considering the uh, compression reinforcement in the beam. So previously we only looked at this bottom steel, we didn't count on this top steel at all, now I want to see what kind of moment capacity we have if we actually consider it. So in terms of terminology, oh, well, that's an interesting phrase. In terms of terminology, um, we are going to have, uh, we need to have, we're going to have a lot of variables flying around here and we need to have some way of distinguishing between the compression reinforcement and the tension reinforcement. So I'm going to, we're, uh, I'm going to, and most uh, references and the ACI uh, use this kind of terminology or this type of, type of nomenclature. So, for, so what I'm going to use is what you might call a prime uh, notation. So for example, AS is going to be the area of steel. And then we'll also have AS prime. So AS would be the area of the tension reinforcement, the total area of tension reinforcement. While AS prime will be the area of compression reinforcement. So 
So anything without a prime or will refer to, so things without a prime will refer to the uh, tension reinforcement and quantities with a prime will refer to the compression reinforcement. So what I mean by that is we'll have things like instead of just a depth D, we will have a D prime in terms of instead of just an epsilon S, uh, for example, epsilon steel, we might have an epsilon S prime. So if you see a prime, that refers to the, uh, or a prime refers to one, a quantity describing the uh, compression steel system. So a bit of nomenclature. Now, in terms of area of steel and area of steel prime, I want it for illustration purposes, I wanted to do a beam that had the same amount of compression reinforcement as tension reinforcement, just so we could get into the, just so we could see what the effect of actually outright doubling the amount of, of steel that is present in the beam, but using this compression reinforcement rather than tension reinforcement. In usual practice, you're probably not gonna have something like this. It's more uh, standard to have much less tension reinforcement than compression reinforcement. So we have three number eight bars at the top and bottom. Maybe in a real beam, you'd have something like two number six bars at the top or two number sevens with you know three number nines or something. So this is a bit unusual and unrealistic, but I think it's useful for teaching uh, and for illustrating the mechanics of compression reinforced beams. Okay, so I next need to consider the mechanics. And when considering the mechanics, let's go back to the basics, uh, the very basic basis of this course, which is uh, our mechanics beam theory of stress, strain, and forces. So let's consider the mechanics. And, oh, I should, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and write out a few quantities that we'll need. Again, our area of steel, as we calculated previously, was 2.36 inches squared. And that is also equal to our area of steel prime because we have a bit of an unusual beam that has a rather large amount of compression reinforcement. So, and of course, the force in the, now, just because we add tension, rein, or just because we add compression reinforcement doesn't mean that the tension steel is gonna change at all. And so the same amount of tension steel is present. And remember, the T, the tension force, is based on all of the tension steel yielding. And since we haven't done anything to the tension reinforcement, that tension force T is going to remain exactly the same. It will not change at all. So that comes, and that, as we found previously, was equal to 141.4 kips. 141.4 kips. So now I wanna go and draw out some uh, stress, strain, and force diagrams. So let's go and review the mechanics. So first I want to look at strain diagram, a strain diagram. And I'm going to have my epsilon t at the bottom. And we're still going to have the epsilon cu at the top. That's not changing. And then at a certain depth, we will have our tension, or sorry, our compression steel. And we can use an epsilon s prime for that. Epsilon s prime refers to the strain of steel, uh, but in for prime for the compression reinforcement. And I'll just go ahead and draw some uh, continuing lines here. So this is our strain diagram. Then in terms of stress, so we still have our steel and that's just gonna be at the yield stress for the uh, tension reinforcement. We're still, assume that we're still assuming that the steel yields, or that the tension steel yields. Then we're still gonna have our Whitney stress block. So we have our Whitney stress block, uh, stressed up to the same 0.85 F prime C. And then we have another stress value, which I'll just draw as a line which represents the stress in the compression steel. And we can designate this F S prime. Then in terms of forces, so this is our stress diagram, and then forces. In terms of forces, let's see if I draw a reasonably vertical line. Uh, better than some I've done. We are going to have a few things. So first we have C sub S, which is the compression force in the steel, or the steel compression force. And then we have C sub C. And these are, now, C sub C is exactly what we've used previously, although we don't, we don't, uh, I, haven't been, I haven't been usually labeling it as C sub C. 
that is the uh, C sub C is the uh, total summed compression force from the Whitney stress plot. So in terms of forces that we need to be aware of, let me just label these. C sub S is the, the total force in the compression steel. Uh, C sub C is the uh, compression force in the concrete. And T, or actually it shouldn't be C sub T, sorry, that should just be T. Helps if I label things properly. T is our same tension force, our tension steel force. And as long as the steel has indeed yielded, then we'll have T equal to AS, the area of that steel, times Fy. Now, it might be tempting to just say, oh, well, this isn't too hard. If T is equal to AS Fy, could C sub C or could C sub S, the force in the uh, compression steel, be equal to AS prime Fy? And the answer is no, unfortunately. It ends up being, it's going to be a bit more complicated than that. In fact, uh, designing beams or uh, analyzing beams with uh, compression steel uh, present is substantially more complicated and more involved than designing uh, or analyzing beams with simply uh, it was only tension steel present. So, and the reason this doesn't work is that, think about this. Epsilon T is all the way down here. The tension reinforcement is all the way down at the bottom of the beam, and it can be assumed that that steel is going to yield. Meanwhile, the epsilon steel prime, the compression reinforcement, it's actually at a lower strain level than the concrete. The concrete crushing strain is 0 0.003, as you may recall, that's the value we assume. And just based on the diagram here, our epsilon S prime, the strain in our compression reinforcement, is going to have to be less than this. And typically, our uh, yield strains are not, gonna, are not going to satisfy this. So it is very unlikely that the epsilon S prime will actually be beyond the yield stress, or sorry, beyond the yield strain. It can sometimes happen, but we can't simply say, oh, the uh, compression steel is also yielding, that is not typical except in very uh, slightly unusual uh, situations. So instead, we need to actually, uh, unfortunately, there's no easy way to do this. There's not one simple direct equation that we can just calculate T and multiply by a predetermined moment arm. Instead, we're going to have to really focus on these mechanics, and we're going to actually have to iterate based on various values of the neutral axis. And so let's take a look at what I mean by that. So I'm going to clear this board, and then we'll I'll leave this up for now, and we'll start looking at this. So I want to further consider what is so tricky about solving for the uh, moment capacity of compression reinforcement. So we know by equilibrium, by simple equilibrium, I must be able to sum forces in the x direction and get a uh, total force of zero. So let's think about what kind of forces we have here. I have my compression forces pointing to the right and my tension force pushing to the left, or pulling to the left and pushing, or whatever you want to call it. So um, by a simple sum of forces in the x direction, I can see that C sub C plus C sub S, again C sub C is the compression force in the concrete, and C sub S is the compression force in the compression steel, that must be equal to our tension force T. So that's fine. That doesn't look too bad. And But however, let's take a look at what makes these up. So our tension force T, that is very easy to calculate as long as we are assuming that the steel is yielding. So that's not too bad. That's just ASFY. But let's look at what goes into each of these. So C sub C, that is the compression force in the concrete. That depends on primarily on A, the Whitney stress block depth. Once we know the for a wet rectangular beam like this, if we know the Whitney stress block depth, we can exactly calculate our C sub C, no problem. However, that C, that A is going to be some function of the neutral axis depth C. A, so ultimately C sub C is also a function of C. So C sub C, the compression force, is a function of our neutral axis depth. Now, let's look at our steel reinforcement, or sorry, our, com our compression steel, the force in our compression steel. That is uh, also, unfortunately, a function of, uh, of our strain. 
our strain depth, our strain diagram, and in turn, our uh, mutual axis depth. So in other words, if I make, it, let's say I, if, if I raise this up, imagine taking this diagram and moving this up. In that case, the only way that triangle can remain constant is if the value of that epsilon s uh, prime changes. So this must also be a function of neutral axis depth. Or I could also say, C, using mathematical terms, I could say that c sub s is a function of c. So our, and that's a capital C in case that's not clear. So capital C sub s is equal to a, so in other words, the uh, compression steel force is a function of our neutral axis depth. And so while you could possibly work through some very complicated algebra, rel relatively complicated algebra to directly solve for C, it would end up being uh, likely some quadratic equation, but, in, but even that has some issues with it. So really the best way to solve this is via, iter is via iteration. We are actually going to have to solve this by iteration. So the strategy for calculating, for, uh, calculating moment capacity of, uh, reinfor of uh, reinforced concrete beams with compression reinforcement is that we are going to iterate around the neutral axis depth and equilibrium. to iterate around the neutral axis depth and equilibrium. So what I mean by that is we are going to start by guessing a C. So we're going to guess some value of C. Then based upon that, because both C sub C and C sub S are functions of our neutral axis depth, we can easily calculate a C sub C and a C sub S. Then once we have those, we will check if C sub C plus C sub S is equal to our tension force. That tension force is going to remain the same as long as the steel is still yielding. And so, uh, and actually this will only help with that uh, to ensure that. So we're going to guess a C and then calculate the compression force in the concrete and the compression force in the steel, and then compare that to the tension force T. And based upon that, we'll then adjust our C value uh, until we get equilibrium. So we'll keep making small adjustments to C, moving back and forth until we gain a, a state where C sub S plus C sub C is equal to our tension force T. So I wish there were a simple way to do this, but unfortunately this really is one that the best way to solve this is through, is through iteration uh, solving around equilibrium. All right, so as we've mentioned, we're going to uh, need to iterate around a neutral axis step C in order to determine the moment capacity. And again, our general approach is going to be to guess a certain neutral axis depth then calculate the C sub C, the compression force in the concrete, and C sub S, the compression force in the steel. And then we'll check whether those sum up to equal the tension force, which is equal to ASFY, if we have a steel, if the tension steel is indeed yielding. So in order to iterate, we have to have some starting point. And uh, for, lack of better, uh, for lack of a better guess, I think I'm just going to start where we left off last time. With the uh, pure tension reinforcement, in, in other words, previously, when we calculated the moment capacity of the beam not considering compression reinforcement, we found a uh, Whitney stress block depth of 3.46 inches, which corresponded to a uh, neutral axis depth C equal to 4.08 inches. Equal to 4.08 inches. Then um, let's go ahead and use a strain diagram to calculate the epsilon S prime which is the strain in the compression uh, steel. So looking at just the top half of the strain diagram, we have the neutral axis here. And again, I don't know that the neutral axis in this case is equal to, uh, to 4.08 inches. I'm just using this as an assumption. So I'm going to assume that the, C is e that the neutral axis step C is equal to 4.08 inch, uh, inches. Then I'm going to work through, calculate my other forces, and see if this is in equilibrium. Okay, so we have the height of this triangle, the strain diagram, the upper half of the strain diagram, is C is equal to the neutral axis step, that is what the neutral axis step is, and that is equal to 4.08 inches. Uh, we'll still have our crushing concrete strain of 0 0.003, which is again designated epsilon Cu. Uh, then 
uh, we'll have our d prime. So we have so we have our uh, triangular stern diagram here, and at some depth d prime, which is again the depth of the compression reinforcement, which is equal to three inches, that's where our compression reinforcement is located at. And at some depth, at, at the depth d prime, that compression reinforcement will not have a strain equal to the yield strain or beyond the yield strain. It will instead simply have a strain dictated by the strain diagram. And that strain, we will, des we will designate epsilon s prime, and uh, that will simply be whatever is needed to satisfy the equations here, satisfy the conditions here. Now, in terms of dimensions, because this is, because d prime is three inches, I know that this depth here, from the tension reinforcement to the neutral axis, this is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that is simply 4.08 minus 3, or 1.08 inches. That's 1.08 inches. And so now I have two triangles. I have the larger triangle, which is my 0.003, and my 4.08. And the, this is this is similar, not congruent, but similar to a triangle uh, to the smaller triangle, which has a leg of epsilon s prime, which is what I'm trying to calculate, and my 1.08 inches. So setting these, so just dividing. So, so in other words, because these are similar right triangles, this over this is equal to this over this, or I could say this over this is equal to this over this. It's just basic. I mean, this is middle school. This is middle school geometry. Uh, hopefully, not too bad. So epsilon s prime over 1.08 inches uh, is equal to 0 0.003 divided by 4.08 inches. And when I go and solve for that, I get that epsilon s prime, the strain in my compression reinforcement, is equal to a very lovely number of 0 0.000795. And again, it strains, so there are no dimensions on that. So we now know the strain. Uh, we know the strain in the compression reinforcement if, if the neutral axis depth is indeed 4.08 inches. So how do we, so we need to turn the strain value into a force. We need to, in order to balance equilibrium, uh, in order to produce a force balanced equilibrium, we need to have forces, uh, not just strain. So we need to have a way of calculating our, uh, our compression reinforcement force, not just strain. And think about this. So we have C sub S, the compression force in the steel. And this is going to simply be equal to epsilon uh, S prime times E times A S prime. And what is this? Well, think about the definition of, say, uh, think about the relationship or Hooke's law. Think about the relation, think about Hooke's law, the relationship between stress, strain, and uh, elastic modulus. So there's different ways we could explain to, to we could write this, but one way you can write this is epsilon equal is equal to sigma over uh, E. Or I could also say that uh, again, this is our Fs prime. We're using F, we're, we of course use F for stress instead of sigma in uh, reinforced concrete design. So if I want to stress, I can just multiply epsilon times E, the strain times the elastic modulus, which is exactly what I have here. And if I have the stress, if I want to turn that into a force, all I have to do is multiply by an area. So multiplying strain times the elastic modulus times area will transform the strain into a, a force. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have our strain of 0.000795. Times E, our elastic modulus of 29,000 KSI. Good old kips per square inch. And epsilon steel prime. Again, this is a bit of an unusual case where we have the same amount of compression as tension reinforcement. So again, not typical, but this is for illustration purposes. And that comes to, uh, we have the same area, and that was 2.36 inches squared. Uh, and if you go and multiply that all out, if I multiply that correctly and enter th that into my calculator correctly, I get a C sub S of 54.3 uh, kips. This is a force, so it should be in units of force, pounds, force, newtons, uh, kilonewtons, etc., depending on what kind of uh, units you prefer. Now, I also want to get the uh, compressor. So we now have the compression force in the, in the steel, but I also need to get the compression force in the concrete. And this is equal to the total compression force in the concrete 
represented by the Whitney stress block. So it is taking the stress that's multiplied over the entire Whitney stress block and multiplying by the area of the Whitney stress block, and that produces a compression force in our concrete, C sub C. And so now this is going to be a little bit interesting. It's actually going to be slightly more complicated than simply multiplying by base times height. So the formula we want to use, C sub C, the compression force in the concrete, is equal to 0.85 F prime C. That's our Whitney stress block stress, so no major difference there. And we're going to multiply by AB, that is the Whitney stress block depth, A, times our beam width B. And if we were considering just the, if, when we do oh, any kind of work we've done previously, we just end that there. We just say times AB, we have the area, we multiply, and not uh, too uh, not too complicated. We, it's the area of a rectangle times the stress that air, that rectangle is loaded at, and then um, area times stress is produces a force, and that's how we normally calculate our concrete compression force, our total concrete uh, compression force. However, with this, it's a little more difficult because our area of concrete is actually not exactly equal to the stress block depth times its width. And the reason for that, okay, think about that for a second. Let me uh, slow down a bit and say, okay, why is the area for the Whitney stress block stress uh, application not equal to the base times the height? Well, the reason for that is that we have steel here. And if I just multiply by this, I am counting this area of the steel twice. So um, I don't actually have concrete where that rebar is present. I only have steel. And we're already accounting for that capacity in our steel strength here. So what I'm going to do is I will subtract out the area of the steel, or in particular the area of the compression reinforcement. So this isn't going to come to very much. You know, we're talking about, you know, a small amount here, but it is something we want to, we should consider if we want to do this properly. So that's 0 0.85 times our F prime C value of 4,000 PSI. And uh, then times uh, 3.46 inches. That's our, uh, that was our previously calculated Whitney stress block depth times our beam width of 12 inches. And that is the area of our Whitney stress block. And then we subtract out the area of our compression steel. Uh, so we don't double count that. And that is 2.36, uh, 2.36 inches squared. So I haven't gone and calculated the exact area here. Actually, you know what? I have a calculator. Why don't I just go and do that? I'm actually curious. Let's take a look. How much would, how bad would it be to actually, uh, if we calculate our area of steel without subtract, or if we have calculated the area of our concrete uh, Whitney stress block without subtracting the area of the steel? So, um, it, we, and I can do that just by, if I want to calculate a percent or a percent error, I can just divide 2.36 by 3.4 uh, times 12. And that comes to 2.36 divided by 3.4 times 12. That comes to about 5.7%. So, yeah, actually that is fairly significant. Um, I don't, I wouldn't want to have a structure that is dependent on that small of an area. I don't want to. I don't want to work or live in a structure that has that small of a margin between failure and uh, between uh, successful operation and collapse, for example. But that is still a substantial amount. So it is. It, so at least in this case, and this is kind of an extreme case again, where we have the same amount of compression reinforcement as tension reinforcement. So in reality, it'd be more like one or two percent in most cases. But again. Um, it is good if we want to analyze properly that we shouldn't be double counting the area of our steel. So, but anyway, that with that aside, that aside, if I go and multiply that out, I will get a compression force, C sub C equal to 133.4 kips. If I manage to add that correctly or multiply that correctly. And now I need to compare, I need to see if I'm at equilibrium. So I've calculated my, my compression force in my steel and the compression force in my concrete. And I need to compare that to the total tension force in the in the tension reinforcement to see if we are in uh, force bounds, if we are in equilibrium. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to compare, let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to compare C sub C plus C sub S, our the, the, for the total force in our concrete, plus the total, for the total force in our concrete Whitney stress block, 
plus the total force in our uh, compression steel. And then we're going to compare that to T, the total force in our tension steel, if that tension steel has yielded. And so um, I'm going to, so if I go ahead and do that, well, if you go ahead and add this plus this and compare that to our tension force T, you will get on this side, you will get 187.7 kips. And on this side, we will have 141.4 kips. So we are definitely not in equilibrium. We have way too much force in the compression on the compression side of this ledger and not enough force on the tension. And without adding more tension or reinforcement, we can't actually change that value. Again, this is a this is at the yield. The tension force is taken is determined by multiplying the area of the tension reinforcement times its yield stress. And by the models we're assuming, we're assuming that steel, the way we're treating steel is that steel cannot carry any stress beyond its yield stress. So this is really all the, steel, the tension reinforcement can do. 141.4 kips, that is the absolute limit on the amount of force that, that steel can carry if we're using the elastoplastic assumption as we do in reinforced concrete design. So uh, instead, we need to, we don't need to redesign the beam. Rather, what we need to do is uh, realize that we made an incorrect assumption. In the uh, case of this, the simple tension reinforcement, which we've done previously, we directly calculate the uh, neutral axis depth. But here, what we're doing is we are guessing a C, iterating, see, see if we're, uh, we see if we're in equilibrium or not. And then based upon that, we determine um, whether how we need to adjust our assumed C. And we just keep doing that until we end up with something that is reasonably close within, you know, a fraction of a percent or so. Okay. So again, in other words, what we have here, we're not in forced equilibrium. We have excess compression force capability or excess compression capacity. So uh, in other words, another way of saying this is that we have too much Whitney stress block. We need to make this Whitney stress, if we want to have, if this side of the equation of the ledger can't change, if this side of the balance sheet can't change, the only way to bring this into balance is to reduce this quantity. And to reduce this, what I need to do is reduce the depth of the Whitney stress block. And to do that, how I do that is by reducing my neutral axis depth C. So we're going to try, so in next, so this is our first iteration. And what I want to do is I want to guess a new C. And using that, I'll recalculate C sub C and C sub S. And again, compare it to T to see uh, where we end up. So continuing on, uh, we've determined that our initial guess for our, our initial estimate for our uh, neutral axis depth was, was too large, so we need to reduce that. So I'm going to move to a, oh, we could do this in a number of ways, but I'm just going to guess a nice kind of round number. I'm going to guess that C, our neutral axis depth, let's try three and a half inches. Again, we had too much force on the compression steel side or on the compression steel side, just the compression side period in our uh, equilibrium calculation or our force balance calculation. And based upon that, we knew that we have basically had too much Whitney stress block depth. We're counting on too much area of concrete, so we need to shrink that up a bit and reduce the, the, the compression side of the ledger until it's equal, to, hopefully equal to our tension side of the ledger. So let's go ahead and guess that C is equal to three and a half inches. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll try this. And when we try C equals three and a half inches, let's see. So A, that's still just equal to uh, beta one C. And because beta one is entirely, thankfully beta one is not a function of neutral axis depth. Otherwise that might get quite annoying. It's a, it, beta one is only a factor of the F prime C of the concrete. So thankfully that's not going to change. The beta one value won't. So that's still beta one times C and 0.85 uh, times uh, C is going to be equal to a value of 2.975 inches. And I can set up my, uh, my strain diagram again. So I still have the same 0 0.003, my epsilon CU at the top of my strain diagram. And at uh, some depth, D prime, I will have my uh, epsilon S prime which is the strain in the uh, compression reinforcement, epsilon S prime. Uh, then I know that this is at a depth. I know that my D prime is equal to three inches. So I guess I don't need to double draw that, that's fine. And my overall neutral axis depth now 
or the overall height of this whole triangle is uh, three, three and a half inches. 3.5 inches. Okay. So we have a depth, an overall triangle depth of 3.5 inches. We have a d prime. That's not going to change uh, because the, the steel itself isn't actually moving. We're just changing where we're assuming neutral axis depth. And when you run through those similar triangles, uh, I get that epsilon s prime, the strain in the compression reinforcement is equal to 0 0.0005. Okay. So now, on a, so based on that, I can go and recalculate my uh, capital C sub S, the compression force in the steel, which again, as we saw, it was equal to A S prime times the elastic modulus uh, times the uh, A S prime, the area of the steel times the elastic modulus times epsilon S prime. And when I go and multiply that out, I get a value of 34.2 kips. And if you want, you can pause here and compare that to the previous value. That would be interesting. And then C sub C, the uh, compression force in the concrete is equal to 0 0.85. Again, this is just uh, based on applying the Whitney stress block uh, stress, the 0.85 F prime C over the uh, area of the Whitney stress block, which is just A times B. A being the depth of the Whitney stress block, B being the width of the uh, rectangular beam. And so let's see, when I multiply all that out, uh, I substitute that and multiply all that out, I get a value of 113.4 kips. If you're working along to this, you can check my numbers. Hopefully they're correct, but uh, you never know when you write your own problems. <laughs> so um, actually you do know if you just do your math and check and this should be reasonably accurate. But anyway, it's famous last words. <laughs> okay, so uh, now let's determine if, so we've calculated our C sub S, and our C sub C, now let's go and calculate if we're in equilibrium or not. So uh, on this side of the ledger, I'm going to have C sub S, again, the compression force in my steel, and I'll have uh, C sub C, the total compression force in the concrete, and I'll co compare that to the tension force T, which is just the, uh, the, the force you get if you apply the yield stress of the steel over the entire uh, tension reinforcement area. So adding these two together, 34.2 plus 113.4, um, I get, uh, let's see, 34.2, ah yes, uh, if I do this, I get a, uh, yeah, I have my three, sorry about that, I have my uh, C sub C, or sorry, C sub S of 34.2, my C sub C of 113.4, and on this side of the ledger, I get a total force of 147.6 uh, kips. And on this side, I have 141.4 kips. And that's not changing. That's just, again, the tension force in the steel. So we have the, uh, so we're better than we were last, we were better than we were last time, but the basic relationship still hasn't changed. The, compression, the total compression force is still greater than the total tension force. And so um, that's uh, not gonna be in equilibrium, that's not gonna work out. So instead we need to adjust this a couple more times. And uh, so if you want a general rule for this, if you need to figure out, okay, if you're struggling to figure out, okay, uh, in terms of adjusting C up or down, the neutral axis step up or down, you can do this too, you can conceptualize this a couple different ways. You can think of the mechanics definition or you have the pure mechanics definition where you have, okay, well, if I have excess compressive capacity, I need to decrease the, width of the Whitney stress block or the depth of the Whitney stress block. And I would really encourage you to look at things that way. I think that's probably the most useful uh, way to look at it. Or if you just like a simple rule, you can also say uh, something like this. If your tension force is going, if you calculate, if you assume a certain neutral axis depth, and on one iterate, on one step of the iteration, you find that T is less than C sub C plus C sub S, that means you need to decrease your uh, your uh, neutral axis step C, so decrease C. And if T is greater than C sub C plus C sub S, in turn, you need to increase C. And you just keep doing that until you arrive at a certain value, or until you arrive at equilibrium to a reasonable degree of accuracy. And rather than boring you by working through many, many loops of this by hand, uh, I went ahead and used a computer tool. So, you know, 
I am showing you this doing hand calculations, but realistically, the best way to do this is to use some sort of computer tool. You could use Excel and its solver function. Uh, you could use something like SMATH or MathCAD. Uh, you can use any number of things. Uh, you, you could even use MATLAB if you want, uh, iterating based on uh, C. That can do iteration pretty well. But use a I would recommend using a computer method of your choice and iterating um, until you get a solution. And I, I don't want to work through this one more time, but just at the final iteration value I got, so we can check that just to make sure we are at equilibrium. And then once we're sure that we're at force equilibrium, then we'll go and actually calculate a moment capacity. So when I did this, when I used a computer tool, I used I personally used Excel, but I could have just as well used SMATH. And if you want to use SMATH, see the SMATH, uh, see the SMATH video series on my channel. I've uh, I'll put some work into that, and hopefully I'll appreciate that or find that useful maybe. Um, so uh, I used a computer and got to finish the iteration because again we could go through this many times, uh, but you just get like any iteration you get closer and closer and closer. I used to computer tool, aka Excel in my case, and I got that C is equal to 3.48 inches. So if, um, and I just use the solver function if you're curious on that. You can I'll look up the Excel solver function if you are not familiar with it. But I want to run through this calculation one more time using our final value of C equals 3.48, just as a final check to make sure we're at a reasonable value of equilibrium. All right, so let's work through our equilibrium calculations one more time using my iterated value of C is equal to 3.48 inches, where C again is the neutral axis step. Uh, so 3.48 inches. And in turn, our A, our Whitney stress block depth, will be beta 1 times C, or 0 0.85 uh, times, uh, and again, beta 1 in our case, because our F prime C value is 0.85, so times 3.48 inches. And I get an A, a Whitney stress block depth, of 2.96 inches. Then I can go and get my, uh, let's actually go ahead and draw out the strain diagram again. I have my 0 0.003 concrete uh, crushing strain. I have my neutral axis step C, which is equal to this 3.48 inches. I'm going to have some strain in my uh, compression reinforcement, epsilon S prime, and I'll need to solve for that. And uh, then in terms of depth, let's see, my D prime, the depth of my Compression reinforcement, that's not changing, that's still that same three inches. That same three inches. And then this little triangle here has to, in turn, if this is three inches and this whole thing is 2.48 inches, that little piece of the triangle has to have a height of 0 0.48 inches. So if I set up similar triangles, I get that epsilon s prime uh, is going to be equal to uh, 0 0.000, so very small strain, 0.000417. And that is our, again, that is the strain in our compression reinforcement, and we use the prime to indicate that. Epsilon s would just be the strain in tension reinforcement. Okay, so I can then go and calculate my c sub s and c sub c. c sub s, as a review, is the force, the compression force in our compression steel. So that's equal to as times f, uh, or sorry, as prime, the area of our compression reinforcement, times epsilon s prime, the strain in our compression reinforcement, times uh, the elastic modulus, which as long as it's made of steel is gonna stay at 29,000. And so that area, a s prime, that's not changing, we've already calculated that before, that is 2.36 inches squared. No great change there. Uh, times our strain value in our compression reinforcement of 0 .00, uh, 0 0.00417, Uh, times E of 29,000 KSI. And if you go and multiply all that out, assuming and I, if you go and multiply all that out, hopefully you get the same number I did, I got a CS value of 28.5 uh, kips. Then, so that is the, again, that is the force in the steel, in the compression steel, uh, produced by our strain diagram. So, and compare that to our tension reinforcement. Remember, our tension reinforcement 
at yield has a force of 141 uh, 0.4 kips, so 141 kips versus 29 kips. So this compression of steel is going to carry much less force than the uh, tension reinforcement, and that's simply because this isn't going all the way up to the yield stress. And then sub C sub C, our concrete compressive uh, force, this is equal to 0 0.85 F prime C uh, times and again, we need to take the area of the Whitney stress block minus the area of the compression reinforcement, so that's 12 inches, times uh, our, our calculated A of 2.96 inches, and then subtracted, subtracting out the AS prime, where AS prime is, that, is going to be that 2.36 inches squared. We just need to, again, we need to do that, but we need to have this subtraction here because we need to make sure we're not double counting the area of our compression reinforcement. And I get a value equal for C sub C equal to 112.8 kips. So if I then compare these, on one side I have all my total compression force, C sub C plus C sub S, and on the other side I have my tension. I have 28.5 kips plus C sub S of 112.8 kips, and my tension reinforcement uh, force of 141.4 kips. And if you go and add, those, add, add these on the everything on the left side, you will indeed get 141.4 kips, which is approximately equal to our tension force of 141.4 kips. So after a long series of iterations, we arrive that in fact, yes, the neutral axis depth C is equal to 3.48 inches. And we will use this and our other forces in the next step where we actually calculate the moment capacity. Uh, you could calculate the moment capacity at each stage of iteration if you wanted to, but really there's no point unless you're just uh, unless you're doing that as part of a computer tool. Uh, it's just extra work. You, I mean, you could, I guess you could, well, let me think. Could you iterate based on moment capacity? I would have to think about that, maybe. But the best way to iterate is based on equilibrium. That's going to be the most straightforward way to solve for uh, neutral axis step C. I'd be skeptical if you could iterate around moment capacity, but there might be a way to do that. I'd have to think about that for a while. Okay, so we have that. So we have our neutral axis step nailed down. We have, and because our neutral axis, because this and this are C sub C and C sub S, or C sub C and C sub S, because those are functions of C, once we're locking that in place, we, this number and this number are going to change. T isn't going to change, and now we can just apply basic uh, summation of moments to calculate our actual moment capacity. So I'm going to wipe the board, and we'll go ahead and uh, finish this out. All right, so we found and confirmed our neutral axis step C, and let's finish this out by calculating the uh, overall moment capacity, considering both the compression and tension uh, steel reinforcement. And first I'm going to, uh, again, I have my C equal to uh, that same uh, 3.48 inches. What we previously calculated, and uh, then in turn, uh, I'm going to first I'm going to solve this by to get the moment capacity. I'm going to draw a force diagram with all the major forces present and the dimensions uh, shown. So I'm going to have the top of the beam here, and at the bottom I'll have uh, you know at the, the bottom of the diagram being the uh, tension reinforcement. I have my tension force T, which is equal to 141. 0.4 kips going in, in one direction, and in the other direction I have both my C sub S and my C sub C, C sub C and C sub S. And I found that C sub S was equal to 28.5 kips, again that is the uh, overall force in the compression steel, and C sub C is the uh, compression force in, carried by the concrete, and that's 112.8 kips, if I did my math right. Now, in terms of distances, let's see, from my D prime, from the top of the beam to the C sub S, that is three inches, which is D prime. And D, from the top of the beam to the centroid of the tension steel, D is that same 21 inches we worked with previously. Uh, 21 inches. Now, uh, then in terms of the distance from, uh, again, we have our D prime equals to three inches. Then the distance from the top of the beam 
to the centroid of the Whitney stress block force or the concrete compressant force. This, that's just A over two. And that is equal to 1.48 inches. That's equal to 1.48 inches. So in order, now uh, we could try to, we could solve this number of ways. We could find the location of the centroid of the overall compressive force and find the moment arm JD that way. But I think uh, what, we, what we cannot do is just say JD is equal to D minus A over T. We cannot do that. That does not work in this case. Because again, in that case, for that calculation, that we're assume, in that case, that this formula comes from the case where we only have tension reinforcement, not compression reinforcement present. And the, tension re and the compression reinforcement here is carrying a substantial amount of the overall compression force, so we can't just use a formula that ignores it. So we could do this a couple of ways. We could uh, find the centroid of our uh, overall compression force then multiply by the moment arm, JD. Or I think an even simpler way would just be to sum moments about some point. The nice thing about moment capacity is regardless of where you sum moments, you should get the same couple, the same value of the couple, regardless of where you're summing moments about. So if you want to find the total moment produced by all forces in a diagram, you just need to sum forces, or sorry, sum moments about any convenient point. And so I'm gonna, I can sum moments anywhere. And so I think I'm to make things simple, I think I'll just sum moments about d, about depth d. In other words, I'm going to sum moments about the centroid of the tension reinforcement. So let's sum it, uh, some moments uh, at depth d, or about the depth about the centroid of the tension reinforcement. And the nice thing about that is the nice thing about that is that my tension force, because I'm summing moments at that depth, isn't going to generate any moment there, so I'll only have to consider the moments from my compression forces. So if I do that, I sum moments, so that maybe I can illustrate that as a summation of moments about D. And let's see, that would counterclockwise positive, or well, positive negative isn't gonna really matter that much here, because um, we're just doing magnitudes. So this will be C sub S, so again, I'm summing moments about depth D. And I have the moment created by the force, C sub S, right here. And that is going to be at a distance. Well, the distance from here to the top of the beam is D. And the distance from the top of the beam to the C S is D prime. So that is C S times D minus D prime. That will be the moment arm length uh, for the C S force there. And then uh, I need to consider the, the, the force, the compression force in the concrete, and that is C sub C, and that moment arm will be the same D minus A over T. This is basically, this portion here is basically what we do in our normal, in our normal uh, moment capacity calculation for beams that only have uh, tension steel. Okay, so if I go and substitute that in, I substitute in, so let's, you know, I'll go ahead and write it out. That's 28.5 kips times 21 inches minus three inches, or just 18 inches altogether. C sub C, which is 112.8 kips. And D minus A over two, this is 21 inches minus A, uh, A again was uh, 3.48 inches. Oh, sorry, that's not right. A is 2.96 inches. It's C that's 3.48 inches. So that's 2.96 inches divided by two, like so. And uh, on this side, um, for the C sub S component, I get 513 kip inches. And from here, from the concrete side, I get uh, 200 or 2,202 kip inches. So we see, even just from this, that the vast majority of the moment capacity of our uh, beam here, even though we've added, we've doubled the amount of steel, the amount of, uh, still, the vast majority of the moment capacity is coming from the concrete, not from the steel. So for this beam's moment capacity, at the point that we've, you know, at the neutral axis depth where we have achieved force equilibrium, um, at that depth, or in that condition, we have 2,200 kip inches generated by the concrete and only about 500 generated by the uh, steel. So that is interesting. So take note of that, we'll get back to that. And I get a total value 
uh, basically a summation of moments, which will be equal to our nominal moment capacity. And simply adding these two together, I get 2,715 hip inches. So based on that, so that's my nominal moment capacity, but I do need to calculate my phi sub n. And if I draw the strain diagram, I will have my same concrete compression, my concrete crushing strain of 0 0.003. I have my epsilon t or my epsilon, epsilon s, um, but I usually use epsilon t there. The neutral axis depth is 3.48 inches. And d minus c here, that will be, uh, let's see, that is 21 minus 3.48. And that comes to a value of 17.5 inches. Seventeen point five inches. And if I go and do a similar triangles, I found that epsilon t is equal to uh, 0 0.015. And that is indeed greater than our 0 .00507, uh, which is the yield strain plus 0 0.003. 0.00507. So this is indeed uh, tension controlled. So tension controlled still. And uh, therefore phi is equal to 0 0.9. And simply multiplying uh, phi times mn, that will be 0 0.9 times that 2715. And that will produce a design moment capacity of 2,443 uh, kip inches. And that ultimately is the design moment capacity of this beam uh, with the compression steel accounted for. So I want to erase this and I want to come back and uh, sort of, cir uh, sort of uh, circle back and uh, compare these to the condition uh, without the tension, without the compression reinforcement uh, present. All right, so let's bring it home and summarize our, or compare our results. So I want to compare just with along a couple of metrics, just two different metrics. Uh, the same beam, both uh, in the case of tension steel only, and the case of tension plus compression. And there's two things I want to look at. One of them is PMN, the design moment capacity, and the other one is our epsilon t, the strain in our tension reinforcement. So uh, for the tension steel only, I got 24,452 kip inches, and here I got 2,000. And with the with the tension and the compression steel considered, I got 2,000. 443 kip inches. Uh, for epsilon t, I got 0 0.012 and 0 0.015. So really look at these numbers. Look what happened. I added steel and my moment capacity went down. This won't always happen, but uh, there are, and this is a bit of an extreme case where we're literally doubling the amount of steel. But in our case here, the, t the actual VMN went down when we added steel. I think that's why, personally, I think that's wild. We added extra strong, you know, we, the steel is far stronger than the concrete. Uh, I added more steel, but I actually ended up reducing the design moment capacity of the beam just slightly. So our, our VMN actually went down slightly. And then our epsilon, but, uh, but still it was more or less the same. And epsilon T did rise. That is, but look at epsilon T epsilon t, the strain in our tension steel, that went from 0.012 to 0.015. And that may not seem like a lot because strain just by its nature is represented by small values. But think about this. Remember, to be tension controlled, your epsilon t must be greater than or equal to epsilon yield, the yield strain of the steel, plus 0.003. And remember, what is the importance of the strain in the tension reinforcement? The importance of this, well, among other things, this governs your phi value. 
And not only does it govern the mathematical value, but as you recall, as you may recall, uh, our phi values have this kind of relationship, where we have a, a phi of 0.9, a, a phi of 0.65, and then we and where this is compression controlled, this is tension controlled, and then we have a transition region in between. And the reason we have this much higher fee value on the tension controlled uh, uh, setting or the tension controlled region is that this is that if your beam is failing in uh, steel tension, if it's failing in yielding, then you get then you're getting a ductile failure. This is ductile. This is brittle. And that ultimately really is. Uh, one of the great, probably the greatest benefit of adding compression reinforcement. Notice we put, we literally doubled the amount of steel presence in our beam. Now, if I if I actually wanted to just increase the amount of moment capacity, I could just add, if I really wanted to increase jack up the moment capacity on this, and I want and I could and I could get away with doubling the steel. The best way to actually do that would in, would instead of would be to, instead of adding uh, three number eight bars at the top, the best way would be to add another row at the base. But again, we're talking about compression reinforcement here, not double reinforced beams. And so um, we have, we literally doubled the amount of steel, added just as much compression reinforcement as tension reinforcement, but we actually decreased our design moment capacity. I don't know about you, but personally, I think that's wild. So of course, the logical question there is why would anyone ever do this? Why would you ever use compression reinforcement? Well, probably the biggest single, single benefit is that you, uh, by, by adding compression reinforcement, you ultimately increase the strain value of your tension reinforcement at failure, and so at the ultimate capacity. And so based on that, you can, so if you add enough compression reinforcement relative to your tension reinforcement, you can often, uh, if you have a beam, so for example, say you design a beam with, without compression reinforcement, and you find that it is failing, uh, you have maybe like a fee value of like point, what happens if you have a fee value of 0.65, for example? You might be able to really massively increase the moment capacity if adding compression reinforcement allows you to go from the, the uh, compression controlled zone to the tension controlled zone, that will mean your fee value will greatly increase if you can go from this compression controlled region to the tension controlled region. Or alternately, you might just want to ensure a uh, ductile rather than brittle failure, and compress. And that really is, and really that is best practice. Even if you can use that 0.65, even if you're comfortable, if you don't mind using the lower fee value, even if that's still sufficient for your required strength, it's not best practice to design beams that fail brittle, uh, in brittle failure rather than ductile failure. And especially if you're any, in any region with like seismic uh, forces, any region with um, large earthquake uh, capacities or large earthquake demands, I shouldn't say capacities, but seismic demands, uh, anytime you have large uh, seismic forces, ductility is very, very, very important to the ability to resist and, dis and to resist seismic forces and dampen seismic vibrations. So that is so that is a particular importance if you're in a seismic region. So uh, for any of y'all in, I'm out in Oregon, and so if uh, you're all in Oregon or I was out in the West Coast, uh, for example, Oregon or Portland, you have the Cascadia Fault Zone, and so you do want to design your structures uh, for ductile failure. So anyway. Um, the key thing with the, probably the single greatest benefit of adding compression reinforcement is that you can force a beam that would have brittle failure instead into a ductile failure condition, and that can be very valuable. And there all, are also some other benefits. You can sometimes get some, depending on how you, depending on the relative size of, um, let's say you just have a very heavily reinforced beam, it's possible you're just not going to have enough concrete to balance that force out. And by and so in, in in those cases where if you if you're calculating that you're for example, if you ran through your calculation and determined that your your uh, Whitney stress block depth went all, went all the way to the bottom there, in that case you you could actually greatly increase the moat capacity just by adding more extra uh, compressive force in the C sub S, but that's kind of a rare case. More common is the more common reason to do this is just to add to go from a brittle to a ductile failure. Also, there are some constructability benefits. We haven't talked about shear reinforcement yet, but uh, uh, how you how you reinforce concrete sections for shear 
is by adding shear struts, which go around and contain the rebar cage uh, and their position vertically rather than longitudinally or transversely rather than longitudinally. And you already need, if you're, if you're going to use these, then you already have to have something, you need to have some sort of hanger to support the ends of your uh, shear stirrups. And so it, it, you, you often will end up needing, even if you don't uh, need your compression reinforcement for design, often you need it, you, you can use it just for compression, just for uh, constructability purposes. You need something to hang your stirrups from anyway. And if you're already going to have to put, if you're already going to have to put something there, you might as well rely on it um, for, for its strength benefits. Anyway, that is the basic method of um, uh, designing or calculating, uh, or I should say analyzing uh, the moment capacity of beams with both tension and compression reinforcement. So we've looked at how to do that. The general method is going to be to assume a certain neutral axis depth C, calculate your C sub C and C sub S, your, your forces in both your concrete and your, your, your compression reinforcement, and, comp and keep iterating on that until you get equilibrium uh, force equilibrium between the tension reinforcement and the total compressive force. Combine those together and you will have and keep doing that until you get your C value. And then uh, based on that, you calculate your overall moment capacity by summing moments about some convenient point. Often the, uh, and often the most convenient point is the location of the, the centroid of the uh, tension reinforcement. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. But uh, again, I hope you found this in, uh, enjoyable or at least a bit informative. This is the basic method of calculating and uh, designing beams and to consider uh, not only compression, but tension reinforcement. The important things to know are first how to do it, how to handle the iteration, and also just to have some understanding of what uh, compression reinforcement really does. Ultimately, it, may not, it, off, it typically doesn't add a whole lot of extra moment capacity, or in some cases, it can even decrease it slightly. But its real greatest benefit is that it, that it can increase the strain at failure in the tension reinforcement. And if you're right on the boundary line between a, a ductile and a brittle failure, you can force your beam to go from a brittle failure to a ductile failure, which is very beneficial. So if you, again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe to make the robots happy. I'll see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.